Hey, good afternoon. Uh, we're going to talk about ancient China today. And if you hear any noise in the background, I've got a toddler that's doing his best Tasmanian devil impersonation. That's why this video is a little bit late, so I apologize. But uh, ancient India, uh, or ancient China, I should say, uh, we're going to talk first about geography. Uh, got a picture of what China looks like. And Chinese civilization is going to develop along the Yellow River. Uh, if you see this mouse here, really in this area that I'm circling with the mouse, that's where Chinese civilization starts, and it's going to spread from there. And the reason it starts there is because of the ground. The soil there is extremely fertile. It's called loss soil or loss soil. And basically what happens is wind picks up these sand particles from the desert and deposits them into this warm, moist climate and it turns it into extremely fertile soil that's hundreds of feet deep in places. Um, so that's a good thing. Uh, the bad thing though is it's very loose soil, it's very flat, and the Yellow River floods, and those floods aren't always predictable. And the river changes course very frequently. But uh, when you put it all together, that's kind of where the Chinese civilization begins, right there along the Yellow River. Uh, also, surrounding the Yellow River Valley, if you will, uh, China's pretty secure. You've got water on the, the east, you've got mountains on the west, you've got jungle to the south, and then you've got desert to the north. Now let's talk about some dynasties. When you look at Chinese history, dynasties is the easiest way to go. Uh, the first dynasty is the Xia, and they're semi-mythical. They may or may not have existed. We don't have a lot of archaeological evidence. They're written about in ancient Chinese history books, but they're direct descendants. The people that take over after the Shia, known as the Shang, they don't talk about them, so it's kind of strange. We don't know for sure if they're real or not, but we usually include them. Uh, the first dynasty that we know for sure is the Shang Dynasty. We know they're not myth mythical. Their capital city was actually discovered in the 1920s. No, that's the city of Anyang. And their history was also written on these tortoise shells that are known as oracle bones. And they inscribed or carved their history into these tortoise shells. Um, let's see. They're ruled by warrior horsemen. They have a king. Uh, they're set up in city-states. And their cities were made out of wood. And that's most likely because they had to move often because of floods or war or whatever it might have been. We also have this evidence that the king lived in great opulence. The king was very wealthy and everything went around the king. Um, the king, when he would die, all of his servants would be buried with him, all of his soldiers would be buried with him, and they'd sometimes be buried alive. It would be a, a sacrifice for the king. Um, we have some evidence of their religion. Uh, we're fairly certain their religion was based around nature. Uh, they believed in a deity above. Uh, they made sacrifices to ancestors. They made prayers to their ancestors. And then their ancestors would put in a good word with their gods for them. Uh, kings were considered high priests, but they weren't divine. They weren't godly or anything like that, such as you would see in Egypt. And their religion is very closely tied to astronomy and observing the stars. We also have the Western Shu. And the Shu, also known sometimes as the Zhu, it's the same thing. Uh, they're going to invade Shang China from the west. They kill off the last Shang king. And they're going to invent Chinese feudalism. There are a lot of similarities between Chinese feudalism and European feudalism. Some differences though. Uh, the king is at the top. The king is going to give land to a relative. The relative is known as a vassal. And in return for this, the king is going to get allegiance from the vassal. The king is going to get defense. And the king is going to get tax money. And you can see the picture there, it's kind of, it's the Chinese feudal system. You got the king at the top, the nobles, the peasants, and the merchants are actually at the bottom because they're seen as stealing money from other people. Another very important part of the Shu dynasty is the mandate of heaven. And 
it's this whole ritual of etiquette and customs where it's believed that the king receives his power from heaven, from the the supreme being, and this gives the king somebody he has to look up to. It, it makes it so that the king has to act morally. If the king is not a good, just king, he can lose his power, he can lose the mandate. And if a king loses the mandate, very often that would mean that a new dynasty would come into power. Now in reality, a lot of dynasties used this mandate of heaven idea as a way to justify their taking over for somebody else. So the Shu would say that the Shang lost the mandate of heaven, and that's why the Shang were defeated by the Shu. Now moving on from here, we have a group called the Eastern Shu, and really this is a continuation of the Shu dynasty with a lot of warfare mixed in. Uh, over time, with, with feudalism, the Shus give away more and more land to people, and the Shu kings slowly lose power, and they slowly lose land and, and prestige. And before you know it, the vassals have more land, and the vassals have more political power than the king. So a war is going to start out for control of the kingdom. The Shu king is going to be forced to move further and further east as the war breaks out. And this is pretty much broken down into two parts. You've got the spring and autumn period, and then you have the warring states period. In the spring and autumn period, this, the feudal system breaks down. Many, many, many different states are going to start competing for power. And then when we get to the Warring States period, that's when a full-blown civil war is going to break out. And that should not say 526, that should say 256. So from 481 to 256 BC, that's the civil war period. And the goal is obviously for the stronger states to swallow up the weaker ones until only one survives. Think of it like, you know, a Survivor TV show or something. When the war starts, there's somewhere between 70 and 100 different feudal states. And by the time we get down into the Warring States period, we're down to seven major states. And then those seven major states are going to do the Civil War until only one survives. The one that survives is called the Xin Dynasty, or you might see it as the Qin, Q-I-N Dynasty. And the Xin Dynasty, that's the winner of the Civil War. And they're the most skilled horsemen, they're from far west China, and they come and take over, and they're led by a guy named Xin Shi Huang Ti. Now what Xin Shi Huang Ti is going to do, is going to end feudalism. He says feudalism is what's caused this whole, whole entire mess, we're getting rid of it, and we're going to do something called legalism. Now the first thing that Xin Shi Huang Ti does is he forces 120,000 upper class families to move and live in his capital. And if you didn't move, well, it kills you. Then with legalism, uh, the basic idea behind it, all must serve the state. All must serve the state in peacetime. All must serve the state in wartime as well. The laws are applied equally to everybody. The laws are applied impartially to everybody. The law is literally the law of the land. And then war is good because it can distract from problems at home and it keeps patriotism up. And then last but not least, you have this government bureaucracy. This, the Chinese government's going to grow, and there aren't going to be any more vassals anymore. So there's going to be like a professional government, if you will. Now the other thing about Xin Shi Huang Ti, um, he's the only guy who rules the Xin Dynasty. He's kind of uh, full of himself, if you will. The technical word is megalomaniac. Um, he's going to try and achieve unity. He's going to make all the weight standardized, all the measurements standardized, all the money standardized, all the writing is standardized. He's going to order the construction of the Great Wall. He's even going to ban books and burn books that he doesn't agree with. And he fears assassination. He has a bunch of body doubles. He builds a number of palaces. He builds this giant, fine, uh, fantastic sized tomb that we actually discovered back in 1974. And if you've ever heard of the Terracotta Army or the Terracotta Warriors, they, it's a clay army he had created to protect him in his death. And I've got a picture of a Terracotta Warrior there for you. 
All right, the Han Dynasty is the last dynasty I'm going to talk about. And after Xin Shi Huangdi dies, there's this short little period of warfare, and Liu Peng is going to become the emperor afterwards. And under the Han Dynasty, the Chinese are going to expand to their biggest size yet. Their territory is going to go all the way from Vietnam to Korea to Central Asia. The Han are the one that established the Silk Road so people can travel all the way from ancient China to ancient Rome. And Buddhism, which I'll talk about in a minute, comes to China along the Silk Road. You also have the philosophy of Confucianism that becomes the official government philosophy. And then the most important thing in Han China is to be educated and to be a moral person. Alright, three philosophies. Philosophy number one, Buddhism. Uh, Buddhism is founded by a guy named Prince Siddhartha Gautama. He was actually from India. And he was fairly well off. He was fairly privileged. Um, he had lived a pampered life until he was in his early 20s. He leaves the palace when he's in his early 20s. And he's, he realizes that everybody's suffering. And he doesn't understand why. And he comes up with this idea. He comes up with the Four Noble Truths. He's going to say... Basically, everybody suffers, there's a cause of everybody's suffering, there's a way to end your suffering, and there's a path you can take that stops the suffering. So he comes up with the Four Noble Truths. He also comes up with the Eightfold Path, and this is how you're supposed to become free of the suffering that you have. Uh, the first thing is right understanding. Understand why you're suffering, what's caused your suffering. Uh, there's also right thought, have positive good thoughts, right speech, say the right things, uh, right conduct, just do the right things. Right means, that's have a way to earn a living, don't live outside your means. Don't buy a Ferrari if you can't buy a Ferrari. There's the right mental attitude, the right effort, you know, have the right attitude, I know I can do this, I know I can stop it, I know I can change. And then there's the right determination. Don't give up on creating that change. And then with right concentration, he probably meant meditation. Take time to sit and think about your path and how you can end your suffering. So between the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, what that is supposed to do, it's an alternate way to end your cycle of reincarnation, if you will, it's a way that you can achieve nirvana, you can achieve total understanding. Now Confucianism, before I do this, here is your secret word of the day. Uh, secret word of today is wind, W-I-N-D. Um, the wind is blowing very hard outside right now at my house. Kind of wonder if it's going to storm later today. So. The secret word for today is wind, W-I-N-D. All right, moving on. Uh, we got Confucianism. This is your second philosophy. And Confucius, he was a teacher by trade. And it was really a philosophy that turns into a religion, which is really what happened with Buddhism, too. Uh, with Confucius, what he believed in was morality. You have to be a good person. You have to be a just person, a wise person. He also believed in proper relationships. That's respect in the house, that's respect in your community, and that's respect with your leaders as well. So everybody had to know their role in the house. The son had to look up the, the, to the father, the father had to look up to his father, so on and so on. And this proper relationship idea went all the way up to the king. The king or the emperor by this time, as he would be known as, was the father of the country and everybody was supposed to respect him. Confucius was also high on justice and you were supposed to respect where you came from, respect the history of your family and respect your ancestors. And he would say a good man creates a good government. This is very much a philosophy for the government, it's very much a philosophy for the upper class. And his teachings are collected in a book called The Analect. Now we also have Taoism. Uh, this is founded by a guy named Lao Tzu. And 
this is probably the hardest of the three to explain, so I'm going to do my best with it. Uh, the teachings of Lao Tzu are found in something called the Tao Te Ching, or the Book of the Way. And it's all about balance. It's all about balancing good and bad, evil, good, whatever it might be. So Lao Tzu, he would want people to live at peace with themselves. He would want people to live in peace with others. And he would want you to live in peace with the world. Don't worry about things you can't control. Let go of things that aren't important. Uh, he would also tell you to let go of your pride. Be willing to admit that you're wrong. Be willing to learn from other people. And don't be afraid of change. Go with the flow, if you will. And because a lot of the lower class people, a lot of the farmers, a lot of the peasants, they can't really do a lot. Taoism becomes the preferred philosophy of the lower class because they're going with the flow. They're trying to make the best out of the situation they have. Now when you mix all three of these things together, Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism, that really creates this special mix that becomes China. And even today, in 2020, this mix of Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism still exists. Alright, so that's all for this lecture. Uh, make sure you're completing your discussions. There are three quizzes this week, and there's also your secret word quiz. Remember, there's a secret word quiz for this lecture and for the India lecture, so make sure that you get both of those. As always, any questions or anything, email me, look for me on Discord, and I'll get back to you as quick as I can. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.